Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to our lecture today on Queering Wagner. I am Professor Patrick Cheng, and it's an honor to be part of the 2023 Wagner in Vermont Festival uh, by Tundi Productions. Um, I was really hoping to be here in person, uh, to be here in person uh, in Brattleboro uh, today. Uh, but unfortunately, right before I left on Thursday, I tested positive for COVID. And so, um, you know, rather than bringing COVID to Brattleboro, uh, we figured doing this virtually would be the best uh, course of action. And I think one of the best things, uh, silver linings of all this is to a lot of uh, folks who are joining us, um, you know, by Zoom, uh, will get a chance to know about uh, Tundi Productions and the great uh, work that uh, Wagner in Vermont, uh, the festival is doing. So um, so it's great to, to see all of you. And um, I wanted to start this lecture on Queering Wagner by sharing um, a caricature from the 19th century. This is a uh, drawing of Wagner towards the end of his life that appeared in a magazine in 1877. Can you see this okay um, on the screen? Uh, you know, it's interesting. It's called Atlas in Music. And you may remember that uh, Atlas is the god of strength that is holding up the world on his shoulders. And this is sort of ironic. Um, you know, he's the Atlas in Music. But here Wagner is standing in front of women's shoes and holding a pair of uh, women's boots dressed in satin and has a uh, sort of crown of roses around his head. Um, and so there's definitely some gender bending going on um, in the 19th century, uh, you know, with uh, the press here. Um, and we'll explain this later, but it was around this time that Wagner's uh, correspondence with his milliner, um, where he bought his satins and silks from, Wagner had a silk fetish, and his letters were actually published and made public. And so um, I believe this... Uh, caricature uh, was in reference to this. Um, but also here is another um, caricature of Wagner from the year before in 1876 with the premiere of The Ring and in Bayreuth. Um, as you can see, Wagner is conducting, this is from a French um, magazine and it uh, has Wagner um, sort of sitting on top of a Pickelhaube, which is the German a military hat with the spike on it. So there is some kind of rudeness. You can see it's almost like the spike goes all the way through him. And this one is called The Musician of the Future. Um, Wagner had a book called The Artwork of the Future. And on the hat, it says Théâtre de Charenton Bayreuth. Um, and those of you that uh, sort of know French, Charenton is a way of talking about an asylum or a madhouse. And so this is really talking about um, the theater of the madhouse of Bayreuth, uh, you know, um, Wagner's uh, theater in Bayreuth. So again, I think uh, there's some interesting stuff going on here about uh, um, Wagner and queerness and gender and sexuality that I think we've lost um, today. And so my, I hope my lecture uh, today for the next hour or so will reclaim some of this and uh, give you some thoughts, uh, especially as you, um, you know, uh, participate in the rest of the festival. So a quick outline of my lecture and talk. Um, I'm gonna start with a little bit about myself, uh, my background. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about queerness and opera and in general, sort of the connections, uh, you know, not just with gay men, but in lesbians, but trans folk um, in terms of opera and queerness and then, in particular, queerness in Richard Wagner. Um, and I'd like to talk about three ways in which Wagner exhibits queerness. One is in terms of same-sex attracted people being attracted to Wagner. And a lot of same-sex attracted people in his very close circle, including his royal patron, his son, and um, an important hanger-on in his household that he called his cousin. Um, secondly, uh, Wagner was queer in terms of the transgressiveness of his sexual ethics. Um, and if you think about uh, The Ring, but all of his operas, there's some very strange stuff going on there. And so, um, you know, just wanted to talk a little bit about that. 
Um, and then finally, um, non-binary thinking um, in terms of queer theory, right? That the queerness is not just about sexuality and gender, but it's about um, challenging binaries like male and female, like opposites. Um, Wagner really challenges the binary of the operatic art form, uh, the operatic art form um, in a way that um, was revolutionary. And so that would be the third point about queerness and Wagner. And then um, I hope to end a little after two o'clock and just take any questions and we'll be done by 2.15 at the latest. So um, I'm assuming that things are okay. My apologies in advance uh, if I just uh, end up coughing a little bit because of uh, still getting over, uh, you know, sort of uh, my illness, but uh, so happy to be here uh, today, this afternoon with all of you. Um, so let us begin about myself. Um, so just a little bit about myself and uh, uh, here I am in sort of a, a ring uh, hat, if you will. Um, I am a seminary professor. I teach um, Anglican studies as a visiting professor at Union Theological Seminary, uh, which is affiliated with Columbia University in New York City. Um, some of you might be asking, you know, why a seminary professor would, you know, sort of be able to talk about this topic. Um, but uh, one of the things that I do as a professor and an academic is that I'm a queer theologian. And I'm very much interested um, in the intersections between queer theory and Christian theology, um, two things that people normally think don't go together. And um, so I've written a number of books on the topic of queer theology. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And um, I am very much um, a big Wagner fan. Uh, I am closer Wagner fan, if you will. Um, here is a wonderful doormat that um, I came across um, in Bayreuth um, that says, uh, here wohnt ein Wagneriana. Um, so here lives, here resides a uh, Wagnerite, um, Wagnerian, and uh, definitely um, consider myself uh, having partaken of the magic potion, if you will. Um, and so I'm very interested in queerness and um, Wagner and opera. Um, and I've been fortunate in recent uh, times to sort of uh, trace some of Wagner's uh, you know, geographical areas. Um, in February, I had a chance to be in Dresden uh, at the Semper Oper Dresden, which uh, was uh, where Wagner um, was the Kapellmeister um, and his earlier operas, uh, canonical operas, uh, Tannhäuser and Lundgren. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and actually, just last week, I was in Bayreuth, and this is where uh, my souvenir from Bayreuth was the COVID virus. <laughs> but uh, uh, as you can see, uh, it was at the Festspiel House, and uh, the middle slide um, is uh, the middle slide is me um, at uh, Haus Bonfried, uh, Wagner's uh, last home, and this is his grave where he's buried with uh, Cosima and his dog at their feet. Um, and then on the right is a picture of me and uh, Ricard, a, a statue of Ricard. You can't see his dog, Rus, but there's a statue of Rus as well. Um, and so, uh, you know, uh, this has, uh, you know, been a great experience to um, just uh, in terms of my love for Wagner and also just being in some of the places where he was at. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about queerness and opera in general before getting to Wagner and queerness. Um, uh, here is a picture of Lincoln Center and the Met Opera during uh, Pride season. Uh, and, you know, there's been a long history of gay men in opera. And um, I will just uh, say that I, you'll see a lot of, um, uh, you know, newspaper cartoons and original um, sort of artwork from the 19th century in this presentation. Um, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a um, English uh, cartoon called A Dandy Fainting or an Exquisite in Fits Scenes uh, in a Private Opera Box. And uh, this was from 1818 in the early 19th century. And you can see there are five young men, um, they're dandies, um, you know, dressed in sort of uh, uh, dandy like outfits. Uh, they are in a private opera box. You can see on the left side of this uh, um, drawing that uh, there is an opera singer um, behind the curtain 
um, he's singing and the, um, the dandy with the uh, holding the curtain has the same position as the opera singer. And the in the middle is a dandy who has fainted because he was so thrilled by um, an aria that the opera singer has sung. And uh, you can see, you can't see the text, but I've reproduced it on the right hand side. Um, three of the dandy's friends who fainted said, I am so frightened. One says, I am so frightened I can hardly stand. The other says, mind you, don't soil the deer's linen because the third one is giving him cologne to wake him up. He said, I dread the consequence that last air of Senor non balenas. Now this is significant because non balenas is an allusion to castrati, right? Non balls. <laughs> so um, Senor non balenas has thrown him such raptures. We must call a doctor. And the name has been erased immediately. And the last dandy holds a bottle of eau de, eau de cologne to the patient's nostril. And the fourth dandy says, uh, I must draw the curtain or his screams will alarm the house. Um, you have no fellow feeling, my dear fellows. Pray unlace the dear love stays and lay him on the couch. And so even in the early 1800s, there's a sense of queerness in the opera. Um, one of the interesting commentaries is that if you look at the far right side of this painting, you see two candles that are phallic shaped. Uh, one is leaning towards the other. And so this is a very rude um, cartoon, but it just shows you that there is a sense of gay men in opera. Um, but then it's not just gay men. Um, there is a sense uh, the um, queer musicologist Elizabeth Wood has written a wonderful article called Siphonics, where she talks about the um, siphonic or the mezzo or even the castrati voice um, referring to lesbian erotics of opera and a voice in which she can find her own desire. And Wood talks about how lesbian writers of fiction have used opera to communicate the desire felt by women in the audience towards women on the stage. Um, and um, she talks about uh, one, a, a lesbian couple that uses uh, Gluck's uh, Orpheo and Eurydice. Um, you know, when they broke up, one of them sort of uh, sent music uh, about Orpheo longing for Eurydice and as a way of getting her back. And so this idea of the Siphonic voice is something that also goes back uh, a long time. And so here are just some images of um, uh, just sort of queer operatic voices. And this is not, this is just scratching the surface, but Matthew O'Coin, the composer, Jamie Barton, the mezzo, Patrice Chereau, the director of the Centennial Ring, um, Anthony Ross Costanzo, you know, the, um, Counter tenor Michael Fabiano, tenor John Holiday, Kang and Justin Kim, both counter tenors. Um, Justin Kim has a drag persona, uh, Kim Chi Chilia Bartoli, um, and he was in um, M Butterfly recently. Uh, Christopher Kolsch, the uh, CEO of uh, LA Opera. It goes on. Lucia Lucas is the first trans woman in a sort of major stage role. David McVicker, the director, Nico Moli, conductor, Yannick uh, Nazet Sagan. Um, the uh, Met music director, Patricia Reset came out in 2002, I think, as a soprano, lesbian, uh, Brianna Sinclair, um, you know, a trans woman, Russell Thomas, uh, tenor, and then Francesca Zambello, uh, the director. A um, lot of queer operatic voices today. Um, and so the real question is why? You know, what is it about opera and queerness, right? And um, so one of the things is that there's been some really interesting scholarly reflections on this, um, you know, in the last 30 years. Um, some of you may know these works. Uh, Wayne Kestenbaum uh, wrote this great book called The Queen's Throat in 1993. Sam Abel, um, who was a professor at Dartmouth, uh, wrote this great book called Opera in the Flesh. Um, and then Axel England, who teaches at the University of Stockholm, uh, has written this recent book, Deviant Opera, Sex, Power, and Perversion on Stage. And so if you're interested in this topic, there's some really interesting reflections. And Sam Abel's book is really wonderful. Um, he talks about opera as a celebratory space of queer desire. And, you know, Abel's common, um, you know, argument is that opera is so much about excess, right? It's, it's about just, you know, grandness on such an huge level. Everything is excess, including sexuality. And therefore, opera's queerness, its undifferentiated sexual excess, makes it a channel for the expression of gay desire. And Abel says that he finds room for his own desire as a gay man uh, to ignore normative social rules, 
And he sees opera not just as a hiding place, but as a public celebratory space of queer desire, um, a wedge driven in the cracks of normal desire that slowly but powerfully can help to break apart the normative assumptions that limit sexuality. Um, so I think uh, thinking about opera as a space of queer desire, I think is helpful as background as we talk about queerness and Wagner. So this is just some, you know, um, background discussions about, uh, um, you know, opera and queerness. And uh, so before I get into the Wagner and queerness, I just want to do a quick um, definitions about defining queer. Um, you know, I think many of us have different notions of what queerness is, but I will focus on three definitions in my talk today. Um, and uh, in terms of how Wagner is queer, I already mentioned these. One is same-sex attraction, two is transgression, and three is non-binary thinking. Um, first, same-sex attraction, uh, queerness as an identity, right? The rainbow identity, not just um, sexuality, but also gender. So it's not just the L and the G and the B, but the T, T, Q, Q, I, A, A, P. So queerness as really sort of, um, sort of non-normative sexualities and genders. Uh, so that's one notion of queerness. Another is queerness as um, transgression. Uh, here is Michael Warner's book, The Trouble with Normal. You can see the uh, the groom and the cake topper um, being alternated with a BDSM leather person um, and sort of queerness as transgression. Um, what is transgressive? Well, you know, Gail Rubin is a sex theorist who talks about this wonderful charmed circle that um, inside the circle where the white part is, is sort of the non-queer is normative. And the outside part that's in the black is what's queer, right? And so won't spend a lot of time here, but if you sort of look at the inside part, um, there's a whole bunch of binaries, but, you know, heterosexual, married, monogamous, procreative, free, coupled, in a relationship, same generation, at home, no porn, bodies only, vanilla, all of this is not queer, right? That's sort of uh, normative. But when you look at the outside uh, of the wheel, um, that is queer. The, the corresponding sort of queerness is sort of, you know, homosexual or in sin or promiscuous or non-procreative for money, um, alone or in groups, uh, you know, casual, intergenerational in the park, pornography, um, you know, uh, with the, uh, devices or objects in BDSM. So I think the point is, is that this idea of transgression is a way of describing queerness as well. And then finally, non-binary thinking, right? An important part of queer theory is that so much of sexuality and gender, you know, puts everything into two boxes. And this is where you get the, you know, bathroom signs, men and women and nothing in between. And so a lot about queer theory is about blowing up these binaries, right? So, so that it's uh, not just about binaries. Um, and so you have the binaries like gender expression, women and man, you have feminine and masculine in terms of um, gender expression, you know, um, female and male sex in terms of sex, um, you know, chromosomal or just biological sex, and then heterosexual, homosexual in terms of orientation. And so again, when you sort of blow up these binaries, you know, what really is queer is the middle part, right? That you have genderqueer or andro androgynous or intersex or bisexual. Um, do you see how all of these sort of deconstruct the binaries that uh, we normally think of? And so that's sort of the third definition of queer. So what I'm gonna talk about with Wagner and queerness is how, you know, he reflects same-sex attraction, transgression, and then non-binary thinking. So let me just pause here and hopefully everything is tracking. I'm just gonna ask my friends who are on Zoom if uh, you have any concerns about sort of the speed or understanding or anything, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, you know, and then I ask my friends uh, in Brattleboro, if there's any concerns, uh, feel free to unmute and just let me know. Um, but if I don't hear anything, I will assume that uh, everything is good. Um, and that uh, you're tracking okay. So, um, all right, well, assuming that everything is okay, let's move on to then Queerness and Wagner, um, Richard, Richard Wagner. Um, so in addition to theorists writing about queer opera, 
there's some really great recent writings about Wagner and queerness, and I commend these to you. Um, again, this is being recorded, so uh, hopefully you can come back and take a look at this if you're not if you don't have pen and paper ready. But there's a wonderful essay by Mitchell Morris called Tristan's Wounds um, about you know sort of uh, Tristan's uh, wounds, obviously, and Tristan wounded Solda in this book, Queer Episodes in Music and Modern Identity, um, that writes about Wagnerian um, queerness. Uh, Lawrence Dreyfus has an entire book called Wagner and the Erotic Impulse uh, from 2010. And then Alex Ross, and a lot of you may know about his book, uh, Wagnerism, uh, Art and Politics in the Shadow of Music, has a chapter um, on Wagnerian queerness, actually uh, talks about in several chapters. Um, and so let me talk about the three things I talked about. One is same-sex attraction, right? Queerness as uh, identity. And um, what's really interesting is as early as 1903, there was an entire book written on Richard uh, Richard Wagner and um, homosexuality. Uh, this is the cover of the book um, by a person named Hans Fuchs, uh, Richard Wagner und die Homosexualität, published in 1903. Um, and you can get this book uh, online. Um, and um, Fuchs uh, theorizes that Wagner was actually what he calls a spiritual homosexual. So not someone that acted upon it, but was spiritually connected with uh, homosexuals. Um, and uh, what I find also very interesting is that in 1908, um, there was a questionnaire for people who wanted to find out if they were gay. Um, so there was a treatise called The Intersexes uh, by this gay author, Xavier Main. And there's a self-diagnostic questionnaire, um, a self-diagnostic questionnaire whereby a subject could identify himself as a Uranian uh, or a homosexual. And one of the questions in this questionnaire is, are you particularly fond of Wagner? So I was just blown away to hear this, right? That that um, you know, a, a question on this inner uh, on this uh, um, you know questionnaire, whether you were gay or not, is whether you're a fan of Wagner. Um, and so this is for real. Um, and then also, um, you know, during the late 19th century uh, was really the time where there was a lot of sexology and where the notion of homosexuality was uh, coined. And uh, Richard von Kraft Ebbing's uh, Neue Forschungen, um, New Investigations, he talks about a patient who suffers from this uh, contraire uh, sexual empfindungen or contrary sexual instincts. And this patient uh, talks about his love for Wagner. And he says, as little as I'm interested in politics, the patient says he has absolutely no interest in politics. But the flip side is he passionately loves music. And I am an enthusiastic devotee of, devotee of Richard Wagner's, which partiality I have noticed most homosexuals have. I find this music corresponds so precisely to our natures. So this is actually listed in this 1890 book as a case study of a homosexual who talks about how he notices that most homosexuals in Germany love Wagner. Um, and um, interestingly, there's all this uh, stuff. Um, in 1909, the composer Alban Berg, who wrote Wozzeck, uh, wrote to his fiance um, after a trip to Bayreuth. Uh, you can see uh, Bayreuth, the Festspielhaus uh, on the left. Um, and Berg was disgusted. He said to his uh, fiance, he's like, uh, Bayreuth couldn't kill Parseval for me, nor could the ghastly horde of homosexual Wagnerians spoil Wagner. Um, so really his point was that there were just so many, a ghastly horde of homosexual Wagnerians. And uh, by alluding to Bayreuth couldn't kill Parseval for me, um, people think he was writing about Siegfried, um, uh, Siegfried Wagner, Wagner, Richard Wagner's son, uh, who was uh, quasi-closeted, um, but he said that notwithstanding all that, Parseval was still fabulous, right? Um, so I, th I think it was really interesting that um, Berg actually summarized, you know, talked about how many um, gay people, or in, at, I think he was referring to gay men, were at Bayreuth um, in 1909. And uh, Mitchell Morris then comments that it seems to be a group of listeners who understood their devotion to Der Meister as a way of making sense of their own transgressive sexual desires and gender identifications. Um, 
Now, what I found interesting, I did not know about this, and I have not visited this bathroom in Pyrite, but apparently there is a cruising ground. Um, if you can look at the photo, this is right in the shadow of the Feshpil house. Uh, um, there is a small but nice toilet house, I quote this uh, cruising site, um, that is open to the public. Countless homosexual and bisexual men meet here in summer and winter to cruise together. Uh, the flap at the Feshpil house. So uh, gay Wagnerites at Bayreuth then and now. Um, and then, you know, the current generation, uh, first of all, did you know that there is a opera called Grinder the Opera? <laughs> um, I did not know this, but apparently it is in the UK and um, apparently there is an original cast recording. Um, but I, I will say very interestingly in Bayreuth, if you've ever been there, the seats are very steep, right? Wagner had designed it to be like a Greek amphitheater. So you can see exactly what people are doing right in front of you, what they are reading, right? And so I was at Tristan und Isolde, and it was really interesting that in between the acts, there was a man in front of me who was um, texting other people on Grinder in between the acts of Tristan und Isolde. So I thought how appropriate and thought back to 1909 and you know, the ghastly horde of homosexuals are still at Bayreuth. Um, so I think, uh, you know, but not just gay men, um, lesbian Wagnerites, um, Alex Ross and Wagnerism writes, as gay male Wagnerites sized up Siegfried and Parseval, their lesbian counterparts dwelled on Brunhilde and Isolde and on the sopranos who portrayed them. And Terry Castle in a, the apparitional lesbian writes about this unsung history of female diva worship in 19th and 20th century culture, which flourished in the sexually more permissive environment of the opera house. Um, the opera was one of the only a few public spaces in which a woman could openly admire another woman's body. And so, and then of course you have Isolde and Isolde's friendship with Brangena and then, you know, Brunhilde and the Valkyries. So there's a lot of women bonding there too, right? Um, and then, um, I don't know if you know about this blog called Wagner Tripping, uh, but Robin McDuff is a lesbian. Um, it, it, it's still on the web. It hasn't been updated in about a decade, but it's a wonderful blog on uh, Wagner. Um, McDuff considers herself a Wagnerite, writes about Wagner from a feminist perspective and a queer perspective. I really commend it to you, um, wagnertripping.blogspot.com. Um, and uh, so... I think there are a lot of these interesting things. Um, and so the question is, well, what about Wagner himself then, right? Like uh, there's all this attraction, queer folk to Wagner. Um, and, you know, this is when I talked about Hans Fuchs's book, um, uh, Wagner as a spiritual homosexual. homosexual. Uh, Fuchs uh, in, writes, uh, Roth writes uh, in 1903, a gay identified author named Hans Fuchs uh, brought out R Richard Wagner and homosexuality. Um, and Fuchs classifies the composer as a spiritual homosexual. So someone who adopts gay mannerisms, who values erotically charged friendships with men, but who stops short of having sex with them. And so Fuchs describes all these friendships throughout Wagner's work. You know, um, I, you've got Tristan and Corvinal and all these friendships. Um, and then, you know, uh, Fuchs writes about this uh, in Parseval, where Parseval doesn't give in to the flower maidens, right, um, in uh, in sort of the magic garden. Um, and I think uh, um, Fuchs actually writes, doesn't Parseval bring to mind those homosexuals who very much uh, enjoy the company of women, who enjoy joking and laughing with them, who do not shy away from flirtatious kisses, and who flee only when more is demanded of them? Uh, right, and and so Parseval doesn't give in, and Kundry and is therefore able to save M. Fortas. Um, and so I think, uh, um, you know, this is interesting that this is being written about in 1903. Um, there's also a really interesting passage that Wagner writes about that a lot of people don't know about. Um, Wagner writes in his book, The Artwork of the Future, a celebration of what he calls Männerliebe, which is the love between men, right? Um, this is Wagner writing. He writes about the beauteous naked man as the kernel of all Spartanhood. He writes about Sparta. And he writes that this love of man to man, which is the Menor Liba, in its primitive purity proclaims itself as the noblest and least selfish utterance of man's self sense of beauty. Um, so Wagner is really holding up Menor Liba 
um, you know, as, as understood by ancient Greece and, and Sparta. Um, but he says that it teaches man to sink and merge his entire self in the object of his affection. And the higher element, um, you know, also includes a, a pure, not a purely spiritual bond of friendship, but it, it was the blossom and crown of the physical friendship. Um, and so there is this very interesting passage that Wagner writes about that a lot of folks have uh, pointed to. Um, and then what I wanted to describe about is that Wagner had a number of people in his life that were queer, same sex attracted, um, that I think many of us don't know about. Um, and um, so he had three people in particular. One was Paul von Joukowsky. Um, Paul uh, von Joukowsky um, was a hanger on um, in his household who he called Cousin Paul who was a artist and also a set designer for him, for Parseval. Um, King Ludwig II, many of you may know, who's the um, uh, the mad uh, king, if you will, of Bavaria, uh, who was Wagner's royal patron, who basically, without whom, we likely would not have had Wagnerian operas because Ludwig saved Wagner from um, financial ruin um, and almost certain imprisonment from his creditors. And then Wagner's son, Siegfried, uh, was a quasi-closeted, although not very secretive, um, homosexual. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about this. It's really interesting. So um, Paul von Joukowsky, um is this hanger-on, cousin Paul, as uh, Wagner called him. Uh, here you can see um, von Joukowsky in the picture uh, with Wagner and his daughters and Cosima, um, just sort of sitting in the middle. And uh, von Joukowsky had a lover named Peppino, who he called his servant. So his servant, he lived with his servant Peppino, who was um, from Italy, who knew how to sing and apparently would sing like the Rhine Maidens uh, music and really entertain Wagner. <laughs> and so um, eventually Wagner, Ricard and Cosima figured out that they were lovers. Um, but uh, von Joukowsky, cousin Paul, uh, lived um, basically with Wagner at the end years of his life. Uh, here he is. Here's another picture. Again, you know, you see Ricard and Cosima and then their children. You see Siegfried on the bottom right. And of course, you have Cousin Paul there again on the far right. Um, Cousin Paul was the set designer of Parseval, um, Wagner's last uh, opera. Uh, as, as you can see, the beautiful Grail um, temple scene. And um, he drew this uh, Klingsor's Magic Garden um, flowers. This painting uh, I took a picture of is at the Wagner uh, Museum, um, at Von Fried. Uh, this is the, the actual painting. Um, and, uh, you know, Wagner just loved this painting and, uh, you know, the set was based on this. Uh, but here's a really interesting painting also um, that cousin Paul painted of called the Holy Family in 1881. He basically took all of Wagner's children and made them into the Holy Family. So you can see that um, uh, Cosima's two daughters uh, from her previous marriage, uh, Blondine and Daniela, are on the right side. Daniela is the Virgin Mary. And then you've got uh, Wagner's three children uh, with uh, Cosima, Isolde, Eva, and Siegfried. Um, notice that he named them after characters in his opera that he was writing. <laughs> so uh, Isolde with Tristan and Zelda, Eva during Meistersinger, and Siegfried during The, the Ring. Um, so what's really interesting is, uh, can you notice someone else here? Who is Joseph? <laughs> but Paul von Joukowsky. So Paul, cousin Paul puts himself in this picture of the Holy Family that it does not have anyone else, but he is Joseph. Um, and so very, very interesting and, and strange person. Um, of course, Peppino is not in there. I have tried everywhere to find a photograph of Peppino. I, I cannot. So if any of you know or have and are able to find this, uh, I'm, I'm very curious as to, you know, I, they apparently broke up, which is very sad, and Peppino moved back to um, uh, Italy. But um, but uh, Cousin Paul was actually at Wagner's death in Venice. Um, he was at lunch the day that uh, Wagner died, um, and uh, February 13th, 1883. Um, and so, uh, so that's one uh, sort of queer, one person in Wagner's queer circle. Um, another was King Ludwig II, uh, who was the um, unmarried king of Bavaria, who 
um, you know, those of you, you can thank him for uh, Walt Disney's castles would not have existed without uh, him. Uh, Neuschwanstein Castle, um, as well as other castles he built. Um, and Disney based his uh, castles off of uh, these castles. Um, but uh, Ludwig was a little eccentric, to say the least. Um, so at the age of 15, he heard Wagner's opera Lohengrin, the, the Swan Knight, and he absolutely fell in love with Lohengrin, apparently memorized the libretto. Um, and so, you know, Ludwig uh, actually became king at a very young age, at 18, when his father died. And one of the first things he did as king of Bavaria was to find Wagner um, because he wanted to meet Wagner. Um, and interestingly, Wagner was on the run from his creditors. And when he got a note, um, you know, from one of the king's ministers saying that uh, uh, the king wanted to meet with him, he thought it was a trick by the creditors to trap him. So he actually at first ignored the request. Um, but uh, apparently Wagner was notoriously a spendthrift, was always in debt. And frankly, um, he was saved by Ludwig. Um, and Ludwig uh, was um, not publicly queer, but was never married. Um, and his letters to Wagner were very intense. Um, here's a letter that the king wrote to Wagner. My only friend, my ardent loved one, you are the star that lights my life and your glance always strengthens me wonderfully. I burn for you, oh my holy one. This is the king of Bavaria writing to Richard Wagner, right? My adored one, how I love, I love you. My only one, my most cherished possession, son of my life, my inspiration and love for you are boundless. Once again, I swear my loyalty to you unto death, eternally, eternally, your Ludwig who burns for you. Um, they had a pretty intense relationship. Wagner would not listen to him. He would not listen to Wagner about performances and all that. But uh, nonetheless, um, maybe this is why Wagner was a spiritual homosexual, according to Fuchs. Um, and then uh, the king had this really interesting relationship with this uh, handsome Hungarian um, actor named Josef Kainz. Um, so Kainz is uh, shown in this photo with the king. Um, and apparently the king would uh, have private performances uh, I, I know that does that sounds kind of uh, <laughs> kinky, but I, I think it was just actually literally performances where he wanted Kainz to perform his roles or be in role. Um, but uh, also the king apparently had his own replica of Venusberg from Tannhäuser, this grotto. Um, but Kainz is in this photo. But what's really interesting is the actual real photo is on the right side. Do you see the difference here that the photo on the right side shows that Kainz actually has his hands on the back of the king, which is pretty scandalous, right? So this photo was never released. Um, when the photo was, the real photo or the photo that was released shows, you see how the, the hand is no longer there. And actually there's a chair that's been Photoshopped, well, not Photoshopped, but put in. Um, and it was also controversial that Kainz was actually standing, which was the male pose, right? The king was sitting. Um, but uh, so, so this is, you know, uh, Joseph Kainz, um, and apparently he was not very responsive to the king, and the king just abandoned him at some point. Uh, and the king, you know, was declared insane and actually mysteriously drowned in 1886, along with his physician. Um, here is uh, the lake uh, south of Munich uh, that the king was found. So all very mysterious, but Ludwig II, really interesting reading if you're interested in queerness and Wagner. Um, and here is just uh, Ludwig II is all over Wagner's uh, The House von Fried picture of him in the library. The bust in front of Wagner's home is Ludwig II, and here's a stained glass window uh, in the Wagner Museum. Um, and then finally, Siegfried Wagner, um, Wagner's only son, uh, was a not-so-closeted gay man. The homosexuality of Siegfried Wagner, uh, only son and heir to Bayreuth, was an open secret. He was called a feminized and almost effeminate version of his father. Uh, as you can see, the cartoons of his father already were pretty feminized and effeminate. Um, and American critic called him a pert and primping imposter. Um, there's a really interesting story that I'll just talk about really shortly. But Siegfried Wagner had an English composer friend named Clement Harris. Uh, it's his photo here. They met in their 20s. Um, and, uh, you know, Clement was the son of a wealthy ship magnate. 
and uh, proposed that they um, sort of travel to Far East on the ship of one of the ships of his father. And so they agreed. It turns out that they were the only passengers on this whole ship <laughs> from like Germany all the way to the Far East. And when um, Siegfried wrote his memoirs of 173 pages, 103 pages were devoted to that voyage with Clement. And he always had a photo of Clement on his desk. Clement was killed in a war battle five years later. And so it's both beautiful and kind of sad. Um, he dedicated his last symphonic po poem entitled Gluck, Happiness. He dedicated to Clement Harris and uh, ev evidently dedicated in private to the dead friend whose picture never left, left his desk. Um, for all other emotional entanglements, male and female, much suggests that in Clement Harris, Siegfried found and lost the love of his life. Um, so, you know, must be hard to be the heir of uh, Richard Wagner. So because he could not be openly gay, he was married to Winifred uh, Wagner, who was actually an English, young English woman. I always found that interesting until I read about Clement Harris being English. So I wonder if there was something there. Uh, but he dutifully had children. Uh, Winifred um, it befriended, uh, you know, the Third Reich. Um, so this is, you know, sort of uh, not great stuff at all. Um, but, uh, you know, basically in 2017, the Schwulis Museum in Berlin, the gay museum, um, uh, actually had an exhibit called Siegfried Wagner, Bayreuth's Fairy Crown Prince, <laughs> about his queerness. And uh, uh, here's a portrait um, from Siegfried Wagner's house, which is right next to Von Fried, which always strikes me as being very sad, right? Um, and so Wagner surrounded himself with uh, queer people, right? Von Tchaikovsky, King Ludwig II, and Siegfried. And so I find that very interesting and not a lot of people sort of know this. Um, secondly, transgression, right? Um, and this is really interesting. Here's a political cartoon or a, a newspaper cartoon of Wagner with an eighth note and a hammer. Um, you know, the eighth note is like a pick that he's putting in someone's ear. Do you see that? Blood is spurting out of the ear because Wagner, like it, it's a, it's meant to allude to Wagner's music is so either disturbing that it causes blood to spurt out of your ear or that you need to expand your ear in order to appreciate Wagner. Um, but this was in 1869. Um, there's a wonderful book called Bad Vibrations as opposed to Good Vibrations, which is all about sort of the history of the idea that music can cause disease. James Kennaway wrote this in 2012 and you can see the cover of the book has this artwork. And there was a sense um, that the eroticism and hypnotic power of Wagner's music could undermine the willpower and masculinity of nervous male listeners. Who are these nervous male listeners? I don't know, violent nerves, leaving them vulnerable to the pathological condition of homosexuality. So there's actually a view that Wagner's music could create um, or bring out homosexuality for people who had an underlying predisposition, um, especially before the First World War. Um, and, um, you know, Kenway writes, uh, by luring young men into a bohemian lifestyle and by undermining their masculine willpower with sensual music overstimulation, Wagner's music could, it seems, create homosexuality or at least bring out latent homosexuality among listeners. And Nietzsche, Nietzsche compared the music to a magic potion that would emasculate the listener. Just drink the filters of this art, my friends. You know where find a more pleasant mode of enervating your mind or forgetting your manliness under a rose bush. So here's a picture of, I think, Brangaena pouring the love potion as opposed to the um, death potion, Tristan and Isolde. Um, but yeah, I mean, Wagnerian music was thought that you could create uh, homosexuality or bring it out of people. And then Wagner's sexual ethics himself were really very troubling, those of you that know his life. Um, so first of all, he was a revolutionary. He was actually expelled from Germany for um, you know, joining a revolution in Dresden. But he was part of this Jungist Deutschland movement, which is Young Germany, which was not only a political revolutionary movement, but also a sexual revolution where they pre proclaimed free love. And there are, there's some writings, apparently, of Wagner proposing to a friend that they share his wife, Minna, his first wife, um, you know, from this uh, Jungist Deutschland movement. 
Um, but Wagner had a thing with married women, as many of you know. Um, these are five of his uh, most intense relationships with married women, of which only two he actually married. Um, so the first one was Minna Planner, Minna Wagner, who he had a three-decade relationship with. Really horrible marriage, uh, even from the courtship until her death. They were estranged, basically, the last 10 years of their life. He didn't even bother attending her funeral. Never divorced. Um, she gave birth at the age of 15 outside of marriage to a girl who she always called her younger sister. Um, but um, she ne was never happy with Wagner spending and moving around and um, all that. But then Wagner fell in love with a woman named Jessie Lasso, who was the wife of a, a wine merchant. Um, that he went with her to Bordeaux, France. They wanted to move to Greece, I believe. Uh, until the um, the husband and Jesse Lasso's mother found out, and you know, so Wagner that ended. Matilda Vessendonk, um, those of you um, may know, um, Matilda is the um, impetus for uh, Tristan and Isolde. Um, basically, Wagner wrote uh, Tristan und Isolde during his love for Matilda. The very strange thing is Matilda and her husband Otto actually let. Ricard and Minna live on their property. So basically, Ricard was having this love affair with Matilda. Many people think it was never really consummated, especially because of how Tristan is all about four hours of unconsummated love. But nonetheless, he had he was writing all these love letters to Matilda, who was married to Otto, and they were living on his property. Um, many people think Otto was really King Mark and Tristan and Solda. Um, Matilda is Isolde and Ricard is uh, Tristan. Um, and so uh, basically, Mina intercepted some love letters um, and that ended and they moved away from uh, the Vessendonk uh, property. Uh, Matilda Vessendonk's poems are the only music of, of, of someone's writing other than Ricard's that, that he actually set to music. And then Cosima von Bulow. Um, Cosima was uh, actually... Um, you know, uh, Ricard's second wife. Um, and what was very interesting is Cosimo was the daughter of Franz Liszt, who never married. Um, Hans von Bulow was her husband. And Ricard started having an affair with Cosima when he was still married to Minna, and Cosima was married to um, Hans. And not only that, um, they had their three children while Cosima was still married to Hans. So I could go on forever. This could be an entire hour just on Wagner and married women. But as you can see, it's very complicated. Um, and you can remember all those, uh, the Holy Family image that I showed earlier. Um, but ultimately, Cosima um, divorced Hans. Minna died. They married. Cosima survived Ricard and ran Bayreuth. Um, and then one of Wagner's final loves was Judith Gautier, who provided him with satins, um, his, his love for fine um, silk. And um, that was also put to an end by Cosima because their letters were getting to be a bit long and, and involved. So as you can see, Wagner had a thing for married women, really did not have ethical issues with that. Um, and there's a lot of transgression in Wagner's operas. Um, and so I will just go through, if you think about it, I mean, you know, just, you know, take the ring, right? Uh, so those of you in Brattleboro, like, uh, you know, with the ring, um, Das Rheingold, not this year, but last year, um, you know, uh, it centers around adultery, Wotan and Fricka, right? It's ironic that Fricka is the goddess of marriage because their marriage is the only one that's unhappy and fruitless, does not have any children. Um, and Wotan's, you know, sort of fooling around is why, you know, Fricka wants Valhalla and that leads to sort of needing to pay the giants and all that. So adultery is an important part of the ring. Sex trafficking, right? Fricka's sister, Freya, is the payment for Valhalla, the giants Fafner and Fossil. And so of course, you know, Fricka freaks out. And so like, um, you know, Photon can't renege. And so that's why he steals the ring from the Nibelungs to, in order to pay off the giants. And that sets the whole thing into motion. But basically he puts up, uh, you know, Fricka's sister um, as payment for Valhalla. Um, Die Valkyra, um, basically the lovely beginning, romantic um, beginning of uh, Die Valkyra centers around incest, right? It's Sigmund and Sieglinde. They are brother and sister, and not only that, they are twins um, that Wotan has, <laughs> is the father of. Um, and so that, you know, uh, Winter Storm, and you hear all this stuff, but this is what's going on. 
Um, and, and not only that, um, of course, Zinglinda is in an awful marriage with Hundig, but a marriage nonetheless. So it's about adultery when Zygmunt shows up in the hut and, you know, they run off. Um, so there's that um, in Siegfried. Uh, so Toy Toy Toy, the premiere tonight. Um, child labor, right? Mima, um, the brother of Albrecht, um, actually agrees to raise Siegfried, who is the um, offspring of Sigmund and Sigmunda, who both die. But Mima does this because Mima wants Siegfried ultimately to kill Fafner, the giant who is now a dragon. Can you tell how complicated these stories are, right? But his whole point of raising Siegfried is because he thinks Siegfried will then eventually get the ring back for him, not for raising Siegfried for Siegfried's sake. Um, and then it doesn't end there. Siegfried actually comes across Brunhilde, um, who has been put to sleep as punishment in the Ring of Fire by Wotan because Brunhilde disobeys her father by trying to help out uh, Sieglinde um, and uh, Sigmund. Um, but Siegfried comes across her and they fall in love. And of course, Brunhilde is the daughter of Wotan, as is Siegfried's parents. And so Brunhilde is actually Siegfried's aunt. Um, so, you know, if you think about all this, um, it's kind of bizarre, right? So this is the ring for you. Um, and then what's really interesting is throughout the history of the ring, there's been all this really homoerotic artwork about Siegfried. Um, you know, you can see these, this artwork from the 19th and 20th century um, of Siegfried, you know, like sort of, uh, you know, um, in his uh, sword, no tongue, Siegfried after he kills um, Fafner um, and drinks the blood of the dragon so that he can understand the bird. Um, there are cartoon um, drawings of the ring and Siegfried, you know, is portrayed here a very studly kind of way. Um, and then all kinds of other operas too. Uh, you know, uh, really quickly, Tannhäuser is all about Tannhäuser, begins with Tannhäuser seen trying to get away from Venus and Venusberg, um, basically an orgy that happens. It's expanded in the Paris version. Um, Tristan und Isolde, like I mentioned, is a four hour opera of unfulfilled love uh, or longing that ends only in death, the Liebestod, all right? And so it's kind of transgressive in terms of the love that can only be filled in death. Um, and there's adultery because um, Tristan is King Mark's nephew. And there is also incest because Isolde is married to King Mark, which makes her Tristan's aunt. So clearly Wagner had something about aunts. I don't know about <laughs> that. But anyway, so so that's uh, that. And then Parseval, people have uh, said, is the queerest of the operas. Um, Armfortas, the king of the Grail Knights, uh, has this groin injury because he has succumbed to Kundry's sexual advances. And the only way he can be healed is through um, the innocent fool, the young innocent fool with you know, um, another spear that can actually sort of do away with the injury. And so Parseval is all about that um, and how Parseval resists the advances of Kundry. Um, and so speaking of, you know, the spear, um, there's a really interesting notion about Wagner and operatic fetish. Um, Sam Abel writes that uh, Wagner is the master of the operatic fetish. You know, think about all these things that have sexual meaning. The ring, Wotan's spear, the sword, Notung, Tannhäuser's staff, Lundgren's transmogrified swan, Isolde's love potion, music itself, and Die Meistersinger. But the greatest fetish is the evil fetish of Klingsor's spear. Um, and so, you know, not surprisingly, Wagner had his fetish, which I alluded to, which he had this fetish about silk and satin. And so, you know, his letters to his uh, mill owner were published Here's another cartoon with Wagner looking at fabrics um, on the middle and right side. These are designs that Wagner drew himself of a morning jacket and underwear for that he wanted. It looks pretty much like a petticoat and uh, women's underwear. Um, and in fact, he had his room where he wrote his music was called the Little Salon. There was an apartment in his Vienna uh, apartment, this uh, map here, um, that was called his boudoir. And it was covered... Um, it was like a Venusberg-like grotto, luxuriously lined with silk walls, with lavishly hung satin rose garlands strewn all around, costly covers and pillows, soft carpets, and this boudoir, as his milliner calls it. Wagner liked to be alone and rarely permitted anyone else to enter. 
And the composer told his milliner he always needed to feel exceptionally warm. So all his satin garments and his house slippers had to be stuffed with cotton, his boots additionally filled with masses of fur and cotton. So really interesting stuff here. Um, a lot of people think the magic garden parts of all keeps on coming back, but the flowers, Wagner apparently loved perfume and loved the scent of roses, so would always have that throughout his life. A lot of interesting stuff there too. Um, so basically, opera and transgression, I think you can understand why I started with Abel's notion that um, his argument is that opera has a way to help us forget revulsions and has great freedom in its access to stage transgression. And he says, when Wagner shows his mythic equivalent of the Ebdibus tale, the conception of Siegfried via the incestuous infidelity of Siegmund and Sieglinde, he says, I get to see everything but the actual act of consummation on stage. And even then, Wagner gives his incestuous pair an orgasmic musical climax that more than compensates for the absence of the actual active coitus on stage. So I realize I'm talking a lot. There are a lot of characters. It's very complicated. But my basic point is that, you know, a lot of queer theorists have thought that opera, in its grandness, basically normalizes sexual excess. And that's why, you know, it queers it and it presents it in a way that is so beautiful and romantic that actually opera actually queers sexual ethics. And Abel actually argues that opera is a kind of sexual drama therapy. He's saying that, you know, it lets us fantasize perverse sex acts and engage with the music. It's like a drama therapy, a role-playing game where we get to perform our deepest repressed impulses in remarkably romantic settings, beautiful settings, and then work them out of our system. So it's a way of dealing with taboo and fantasy without actually having to. Um, and perhaps that is one of the attractions of the historical notion of queerness in opera. So whether or not you buy it, I think there's a lot of interesting stuff out there that I commend to you. Um, and I think I you know, don't want to end anything about transgression without acknowledging Wagner's anti-Semitism. Um, Larry Mass, uh, Lawrence Mass, is a doctor who founded Gay Men's Health Crisis, uh, wrote two really wonderful books, one of which is Confessions of a Jewish Wagnerite wrestling with his love for Wagner and being Jewish, uh, another one on the future of Wagnerism. And, you know, um, Mass writes about, you know, and, and uh, analogizes his love for Wagner with um, his recovery, saying that being a gay opera person and Jewish Wagnerite creates a lot of ambivalence, anger, and he really has to struggle with abstinence, being less vulnerable with intoxication and codependence and more sober and greater detachment with Wagner. Um, so I just want to acknowledge that, you know, Wagner's um, hatred of Jewish people coming mostly, I think, out of Meyerbeer, um, you know, sort of a, a, a composer rival, um, and also Edward Hanslick, his uh, greatest critic. Um, you know, I think uh, one of the things to reclaim this, uh, Barry Kosky um, is the first Jewish director um, at Bayreuth uh, and his uh, Meisterzinger. Uh, from uh, about six years ago, actually takes place in Nuremberg as a trial of Wagner. Um, I mean, this is not the only set, but it is a way of acknowledging and reclaiming some of the anti-Semitism there. So finally, uh, I know we're at time, but I just want the last uh, thing I want to talk about here is non-binary thinking, right? We already talked about sort of gender and how queerness blows up these binaries, right? Um, this middle ground of being queer. Um, I just want to point out that, you know, in Valkyrie, um, there is this line, wie gleicht er dem Pfeiffer, how like the woman he is. Uh, this is where Hundig looks at Sigmund and says that his eyes look a lot like Sieglinde. He doesn't know that they're actual twins, right? Um, and this line, how like the woman he is, um, people used to make fun of Wagner in his time, uh, describing him. I think one of the cartoons, the caption is, how like the woman he is. Um, but this is sort of this um, sort of the ambiguity of both Sigmund and Sieglinde. Um, and then this line, which always gets a laugh in Siegfried, so we'll see tonight, right? Uh, or you'll see tonight. Um, das ist kein Mann, you know, right? This is uh, Siegfried actually discovering that Brunhilde is a woman inside, you know, the armor. That is no man. But, you know, he's attracted to this man in armor. Ha, is it a man in armor? How his image happily stirs me. Isn't the helmet pressing on his fine head? Ah, how lovely. And then shock, that is no man. And so, again, there is this gender ambiguity with Brunhilde there. Um, but 
I will conclude by saying that Wagner has some really interesting operatic binaries that he queers. And this I commend to you. I think this is probably the most interesting thing for me about Wagnerian opera, that the binaries of the score and the libretto, most operas you've got the score, you know, the music and the libretto and the writings. Uh, most operas you have the singers on the one hand and the orchestra on the other. You've got music on the one hand and the other arts, like the, you know, sort of the scenery and the dancing on the other. You've got the exterior action versus the interior action. And then you've got performance versus the architecture in which the performance appears. Well, Wagner actually deconstructs all of these binaries, right? That's what's important to know, that he really revolutionized opera. Um, and I will go through each of these um, these things, composer, librettist, leitmotifs, Gesamtkunstwerk, Tristan Kord, and Bayreuth. These are ways in which Wagner queers the operatic binaries. And um, so, you know, the score and libretto, right? Like in most operas, you've got the score, the music, and the libretto, the writings. Well, Wagner was unique in that he wrote both. He wrote the poems himself that he eventually turned into music. So he was a composer librettist. So no binaries there. Singers and orchestra, normally the orchestra is thought of as supporting or, you know, sort of uh, being, uh, accompanying the singers. Um, you know, Wagner used leitmotifs to make the orchestra a voice in itself, right? Um, you know, you think of John Williams' music, uh, you know, um, Star Wars, Darth Vader, dun, 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 dun. I mean, that's like Wagner, right? You've got the Valkyries, dun, 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 dun. you know, um, Siegfried, dun, 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 dun. Um, and, and so basically the orchestra becomes a voice and actually is in dialogue with the singers when they're thinking of something and you don't know that they're thinking about it, but the orchestra is playing it, right? So that they deconstruct the singer and orchestra binary. Um, Wagner was very much into combining the music with the artistic backdrops and dance and poetry. Uh, Gesamtkunst's work, the total work of art or music drama, he preferred not calling his works opera, but really music dramas. Um, that's another way of deconstructing operatic binaries. Um, external, exterior and interior, most operas are very external focused, right? The only way you hear about someone is their inner thoughts as they speak it or they act it. Um, well, you know, Tristan und Isolde is four hours of longing and it starts with the Tristan chord, which many people have said is probably the most important chord in modern music. Um, it is a chord that never resolves, right? And basically after the chord, it is four hours of music that never resolves until the last notes of the entire opera uh, when Isolde dies in the Liebestow, right? Um, and so that amazing sense of like unfulfilled love um, can is, is entirely interiority that is prioritized in Tristan und Isolde in a way that operas normally aren't. And then finally, Performance in architecture. Um, the Bayreuth uh, um, Festival House, the Bayreuther Festival House, um, as I mentioned, is not just a place for the operas to take place in. The orchestra pit is actually designed so that there is a cover so that the orchestra, the audience cannot see even the light. The music is projected to the backdrop, which then comes out and is mixed with the singers. And the acoustics, you know, because of the wood, is especially designed for Wagnerian operas. So the, the space, the architecture is actually part of the performance, right? And so I think uh, there's another way in which these binaries are deconstructed. So in all of these ways, I think what's really queer about Wagner, it's funny to laugh about his fetishes, to laugh about sexuality and all that. But I think what's really interesting from an operatic and musicological perspective is Wagner's works really deconstructs these binaries that we think about opera and in a very profound way. Um, and so I invite you to think about these binaries when you, um, you know, sort of participate in, in the fest, uh, festival in uh, Vermont for the remaining performances. And, you know, why, why is he such a revolutionary? I, I think for me, you know, and, and Ernest Newman, uh, a biographer of Wagner says, each of Wagner's characters and his situations has been created by the simultaneous functioning within him of a composer's imagination, a dramatist, a conductor's, a scenic designer's, a singer's, a mime's. You know, basically Wagner did all these things and such a combination had never existed in a single individual before, has never happened since and in all probability will never happen again. I think of juggling, right? I think when you juggle many things at one time, it's kind of hard to have on off 
yes, no binaries. Um, and it's more about a, a total work of art, the Gesamtkunstwerk that I talked about. So, so that is my talk about Queering Wagner. Um, so thank you for bearing with me uh, during this hour. Um, we have talked about myself, queerness and opera, queerness and Wagner, in particular, same-sex attraction, transgression, and non-binary thinking. Uh, we have about five minutes left for any questions. So I would just uh, invite uh, you before we end uh, with uh, just any questions. So what I will do now is let me just uh, stop the recording and then uh, I will stop the sharing and then we can do some Q&A. So I will stop the recording now.